Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, my name is Jennifer. I'm with uh, Class In. Uh, as you may be familiar with, Class In is the one of the world leading platforms in virtual instruction, um, also offering solutions for hybrid classrooms and additionally ways for in person classes to drive engagement using the Class In platform. Um, we're joined today with um, educator, author, and trainer Lindy Hockenberry, who will be running the majority of our session on engaging students with research based strategies. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will be sending out a recording of the session after the fact, as well as the slides. So you'll have those as resources. Um, if you do have questions or comments or feedback during the session, please feel free to use the chat box. We will be monitoring that. And with that, I will turn it over. I'm really excited to get started. All right, thanks, Jennifer. I am really excited to be here. To talk everything engagement and what the research tells us about engagement. A little bit more about me. I live in Montana in the US. I'm actually headed to Florida tomorrow for FETC conference. So excited to hopefully get some warm weather. Cross your fingers. It's been a little miserable here the last few weeks. Uh, my, I started my career in, in education. I spent a whole career in education, but I started in the classroom. I taught middle school and high school. And I always say now I'm the bridge between education and technology. So my classroom was a computer lab, old school compute desktop computers with the deep monitors and the tall towers. And so I always had what is now a one to one classroom wasn't super common at that time. So technology always came really naturally to me and integrating technology and using it as a learning tool. So that's what I do. I help teachers. I help schools. I work with a lot of ed tech products, making sure that they're of K-12 education. I'm author, also an author of A Teacher's Guide to Online Learning, and you can connect with me on social media, at Lindy Hockenberry. I always tell people when you're at Lindy Hockenberry, you can be at Lindy Hockenberry. You don't have to be at Lindy Hockenberry 5000, because there's only one Lindy Hockenberry. The one, the one advantage of having a unique name. So you can find me on all the social media channels um, just search for at Lindy or at Lindy Hockenberry and you should be able to find me a lot of the strategies and actually pretty much all of the strategies and ideas I'm going to share today are in my book as well. So, I'm curious who we have on the webinar today. Let me know in the chat. What's your job title? Are you a classroom teacher school leader? Maybe you're a principal. Maybe you're in an instructional support role, like a tech coach or an instructional coach. Maybe you are on the technical side of things and you're a tech director, or maybe you're in some sort of other category. Let me know who we have on the line here. Oh, awesome. We got some other, got a journalist on the line. Love it. That's definitely in the other category. Very good. I'll keep going while we're waiting for some responses there. So. Our goals for the session today, we're talking everything research based and engagement. So we're going to look at 2 specific areas that research identifies as key factors to increase student engagement. We're going to then look at some specific strategies to really dive into the how to, how do you implement those research based engagement factors and then start to explore how technology can make these strategies come to life. Let's see, we also have a teacher educator. Oh, I love it. So more university higher ed level, senior content designer. Oh, I love that. So you design professional learning for K-12 educators. Me too. Love it. Very good, very good range here. So I'm curious, let me know in the chat, how do you know if a student is engaged? Like what are, what tells you that, oh, I know that, this student's engaged or my classroom as a whole or in general is really engaged right now. Um, for me in a physical classroom, it's a lot of nonverbal cues. It's a lot of looking at facial expressions. It's a lot of seeing where their eyes are, right? <laughs> or what they're doing or what their faces are saying. Uh, that's why it's a, it, it was really hard for a lot of teachers that had to flip 
to virtual learning from a face to face environment to virtual during the pandemic, right? Because you rely so much on those like nonverbal cues and you can't see them very well in a virtual environment. Carlos says body language. Yep. Sarah says, oh, I love this. So in virtual active engagement in the breakout spaces or within different ed tech tools that you're sharing in, asking questions, completing tasks, tries new things, body language. Love it. All great signs of engagement. A lot of those, not all, but a lot of those are really subjective, right? And that's the hardest part about engagement is so much of what tells us or what we think tells us is student engaged or not is subjective and not objective. So I decided, and this was actually during the pandemic, um, that's kind of how my book, A Teacher's Guide to Online Learning came about was I was, all these teachers are reaching out to me like, help me, help me, I need help. I need help teaching virtually. And I was creating lots of resources and putting out lots of content and just kind of ended up with a book. And people are always like, how do you just end up with a book? I'm like, I don't know. I was just creating lots of things and it just all came together <laughs> into a book. Um, but uh, one of the things I started to hear over and over and over again was that engagement was an issue. That was a huge challenge. And I'm continuing to hear that. I go in a lot of schools across the country, across the world, really, both in person and virtually. And almost every teacher tells me that one of their biggest challenges is student engagement. So I really started digging in as I was digging into the research about online learning for my book and other things, helping teachers during that time. I started to really look at what does the research actually tell us increases student engagement? Uh, and so that's what we're going to focus on today. So I kind of created what I call like breaking down engagement. What does the research tell us? And this is really interesting. And there's a source here that you can read more about once you get the slides. You can click on the source and read more of the specific article. But basically, the research says that engagement is the behavioral manifestation of motivation. So when you're motivated, what you see what comes out of that motivation is engagement, okay? So motivation and engagement are very much linked. That shouldn't be a huge surprise to anyone. But then the research really tells us that there's a huge, huge correlation between engagement and achievement. And it actually goes so far to say that academic performance or a student achievement can only occur if students are actively engaged. So think about that for a second. That's all we think about in education is academic performance, student achievement, right? And the research tells us that we really can't actually get there unless students are engaged. So they're all linked and that's why I really like this graphic here. Motivation shows up as engagement. You have to have engagement in order to have achievement. So the moral of the story is when it comes to learning, Engagement is really, really important. <laughs> That's probably not a huge surprise to any of you, but we, I don't think we often think about how important it is, right? You might look at your class and be like, oh, they're unengaged, but, but it's really, I have to teach this because it's a standard that I have to teach. But the research tells us if they're unengaged, they're really not going to grasp that concept. So this is also super interesting to me. As I started to dive into what does the research tell us of how, what affects engagement? How does engagement show, right? I started to also think about, well, what happens when a student is not engaged? And I absolutely love Schlepti's levels of engagement. I wish when I was a teacher ed person, right, my person on here, that's a, a teacher ed, higher ed person, a teacher prep person. I wish in my teacher prep program in college, they would have given me this when talking about classroom management, because it basically shows that the top is engagement, right? And it's measured by attention and commitment. And when you're engaged, you have high attention and you have high commitment. And then you kind of go down, up and down attention and commitment. And so you get all the way to the bottom, which is rebellion. That's the classroom management problems, right? So really the result of not engagement is classroom management issues, is that rebellion, retreatism, and retreatism doesn't necessarily cause classroom management challenges, right? Um, they're just checked out. So the kids, it's like checked out. They're not going to be disruptive, but they're checked out. 
But when we get down to rebellion, that's when the the classroom management becomes disruptive, right? And it's all kind of a root cause of engagement. So I have to kind of make the research make sense because research can be complicated. I've taken and divided engagement research into what I call these buckets. And this is not comprehensive by any means. I actually usually talk about a third bucket if I have time as well. So not comprehensive, but we're just gonna cover kind of like two of these buckets today. The first is belongingness, and the second is self-efficacy. So starting with this idea of belonging or belongingness. This is the idea, pretty straightforward, that you ask yourself, do I belong here? Do I feel accepted here? Do I feel a sense of personal comfort and support. And you might already be thinking, well, what does this have to do with engagement? Well, the research says pretty much everything. <laughs> it has to do with engagement. If students are more likely to be academically engaged when they feel a sense of belonging. So if a student doesn't feel that they're accepted or that they belong in that space, or don't jive with the teacher for whatever reason, the, the research really shows that that achievement and engagement and therefore achievement, I should say, is probably gonna go down. Super, super interesting. Uh, I think during the pandemic, we really learned this a lot, right? <laughs> that, that relationships are so important, but I think it helps to understand that they're more than important. They are explicitly linked to engagement and therefore achievement. So this really involves um, caring and supporting relationships with both adults and peers at school. And the research really emphasizes the idea of receiving encouragement and that really being linked to a student's sense of belonging. The research also says that creating personal connections is critical to the learning process in any environment. Okay, uh, so and cr literally critical. And in, in any learning environment means whether you're face-to-face, -face, you're blended, you're hybrid, you're fully virtual, whatever. Whatever, every learning environment, creating personal connections is critical. Um, it also talks a lot about teacher interaction and teacher interaction specifically is clearly linked to student achievement. Now, if we're talking virtual environments in particular, the research says that students are more apt to remain active in class if they feel a sense of community. And that community involves both their teacher and their classmates. Virtual teachers have to find new ways to express emotion and make connections um, because just like how it isn't as easy to just visually see signs of engagement in a virtual environment, you have to be much more strategic about making those personal connections. And it is not impossible. And that is something that I stress a lot in my work um, with virtual teachers and in my book as well. I always tell teachers, it really comes down to the fact that if they like you, they're not gonna wanna disappoint you, right? And there's gonna be a level of motivation there. That's motivation. Whether the student has any other motivation at all to learn the content, a motivation of not wanting to disappoint you as their teacher is a motivation. And we've said that motivation is directly linked to engagement, right? Which then is directly linked to achievement. This is a graphic from my book that just kind of helps divide it the idea of creating belongingness into three different buckets, like this idea that you have to build relationships between you and your students. You have to create those personal connections between you, the student and students, and kind of creating a sense of community as a whole in the class. And that's the part that's extra important in virtual environments. So I'm curious, let me know in the chat, I know every teacher I talk to, they're like, well, I already do this. I'm like, absolutely, there's ways that you already do this. Almost every teacher in the world already creates a sense of belonging. So how do you currently create a sense of belonging in your class, or maybe not your class, but maybe your school or organization as a whole? We'll do a little sharing here. And then I will share some strategies.
So one strategy that I find that a lot of teachers, maybe you do, but you don't think of it as creating a sense of belonging, or maybe you don't do, and this kind of makes you realize like, oh, maybe I should do this, um, is creating videos. And you might be like, what? How does creating videos have to have anything to do with creating a sense of community and creating a sense of belonging? The research shows a clear connection. So these are just some highlights from research. And by the way, at the end of the slides, I've cited uh, different research studies that I'm talking about throughout, throughout this session. So the research shows that teacher-created videos increase student satisfaction, increase student participation, and this was so interesting to me when I was looking into the research. They can actually help. So as, if you create, so teacher created here, that's the trick here. Can't just be any video off of YouTube. It has to be created by their teacher. Can actually help develop a quasi relationship between the teacher and the student. Okay. Now with virtual instructors in particular, those who created videos were often able to engage their students even more than they could in face-to-face -face courses, right? And whenever I say this, I sometimes have people go, you're right, like maybe you have someone on YouTube that you follow or someone on social media or a TikTok personality that you follow or someone on Instagram, whatever social media channel you use, you know, kind of called like influencers nowadays, right? And maybe they teach you about a hobby that you're interested in, or maybe they're just funny and you enjoy listening to them, right? You feel like you know that person. It's kind of the same with celebrities, right? Or uh, sports figures. You feel like you know that person, even though you've never been in the same physical space, even though you've never had a conversation with that person, but through video, through TV, through the video and those social media channels, you develop that relationship. Sarah says we do this. Awesome. I love it. Share any tips or ideas you have about uh, creating videos in the chat and maybe what effect that's had on student relationships. Now, another study specifically says that the teacher seeming enthusiastic, and these are the exact words from the study, enthusiastic and upbeat matters more than quality, all right? So now let's take those bits of research and all that information and let's put it into a strategy. So what's a strategy? Belonging is a huge part of engagement. So a strategy to create belonging is to create short informal videos the trick is they have to have your voice in your face. And by your, I mean, whoever the teacher is. If you're teaching a student, of, and this is of any age, by the way, this doesn't matter, preschool all the way up to higher ed, all the way up to, I heard somebody the other day, what did they say? They said from K to gray. I, didn't, <laughs> I just found that kind of hilarious. For, or no, pre-K to gray. From pre-K to gray, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the age. If you're the teacher, if your students are, seeing and hearing a video of you where they see your face, they hear your voice. It's going to create that quasi relationship and kind of help develop um, that sense of belonging. And I always tell teachers, I'm like, you, you probably need to create videos anyway. So this just checks multiple boxes for you. And I found that sometimes uh, when we talk about creating a sense of belonging, creating a classroom community, sometimes teachers are like, I just don't have time. I have too many standards to teach. My curriculum is too big. I don't have time. And I'm like, well, you have to make time. The research says you have to make time, but it doesn't mean that it has to be one more thing. That's what's so great about teacher created videos. It checks so many boxes. So, and I always tell teachers, I'm like, you know, you might think about creating videos for content. Like I'm going to teach you how to um, do the pyraga, 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 why can't I say that word? Let's go with something else. I'm going to teach you how to um, solve a square root. There we go. That's a word I can say today. Those are content type videos. But I want you to think bigger about videos. I love to create lesson introduction videos. So I do a lot of like asynchronous lessons or I call them self-paced lessons, right? Where students are working through the lesson at their own pace. It's not like a direct instruction approach where we're all doing the same thing at the same time. And I always start my self-paced lessons with an introduction video. And I always explain it to teachers the analogy of if you're doing more direct instruction, whether 
virtually or in person. You, if you're in person, you get in the front of the classroom, right? Or if you're virtual synchronous, you do like I'm doing right now, and you say, okay, guys, this is what we're gonna do today. You're gonna read about this. You're gonna learn about this. Here's your learning objective. Here's your assignment, right? Do that, but just translate it into a video, right? A quick two minute video and you're done. And then if a student's gone that day, they're absent, whatever, you don't have to repeat it again. It's there. They just go to the video and everybody gets the same information. It's also great for giving instructions. And again, every teacher you've been there or you've had to give instructions over and over again, record it via video. And if a student's like, I don't understand what we're doing, what's happening here, go watch the video, right? Um, we talked about content. It's also great for just pep talks. Just get on a quick video and just say, hey, I know this assignment you're working on right now is maybe a little tough, um, but keep going. You can do it, right? It's also great for feedback, right? So grading, when you're grading and you're giving feedback to your students, uh, use video or just audio. There's an extension, um, extensions that you can use to add different audio pieces. And Jennifer is going to talk about that in a second, right? So think more broadly about video. And then one other little piece of feedback in terms of uh, creating video is that the research is, there's a lot of information out there about like, what is the ideal length of a video? But I determined it based upon the most recent research says that shorter videos are better. Shorter videos increase engagement. And what is determined short? Well, 30 seconds to three minutes is really the sweet spot. If you go over three minutes, you start to lose attention. And again, that does not matter on age. That's pre-K-12 students, that's higher ed students, that's adult learners. If you get over three minutes, you start to lose people's attention with video. If you go less than 30 seconds, then it's too segmented. So 30 seconds to three minutes. All right, Jennifer, tell us how Class In can help teachers create videos. Yeah, for sure. So Class In as a platform, it was built with all of these pedagogical concepts in mind. So there's lots of functionality that helps you execute against these strategies that Lindy is talking about. Um, Classin is app based and within the Classin app, there is a kind of quick blackboard functionality uh, that allows a teacher to mimic a virtual learning environment, whether you want to play with the platform or you want to rehearse or you want to practice or if you want to record a quick video. So um, Classin's learning environment allows you to change and move where your video stream is. As you can see here, I've pulled, you know, pulled my smiling face down in there. I hope the, the enthusiasm is coming through there. But then you also have this learning space around it where if you want to add text or a thought bubble or a clip art or an image or anything else, and it's within seconds, you can be in your practice Blackboard, hit the record button, provide your lesson introduction or your additional context or your fun fact or whatever that is, record it in the just the amount of time it takes to record it, save it, and then with one click, add it to a lesson. Um, Classin also comes with a lot of metrics around how students are consuming the information that you provide to them. So in every video that you uh, assign to students or add to your course materials, you'll be able to see how far each student got into the video, which is great information, both for knowing how to improve your video content going forward. Maybe you're veering up into that four and a half minute mark and everyone everyone pieces out, or, or pieces, that's a very casual way of saying it, but everyone exits at three minutes exactly, so you know that you need to pair back. Or frankly, if you've got some students who, you know, are only ever making it to the 45 second mark, then that's a good way to say, hey, it seems like you aren't really watching these. Is there a reason for that? Or is there something we can do to help that be more engaging for you? So, you know, there are lots of different uh, video software platforms out there, things that you can record on, things that you can edit in, things that, you know, you can make this as complex as you would like if you are really kind of versed in those kinds of things. Classin gives you an option to do it immediately with the click of a couple buttons and then have it go in an instant right into the course that you're teaching. Awesome. I love that it's all integrated because it's so frustrating as a teacher where you have to go somewhere else and record it. Then you got to download it. Then you got to upload it. Or you got to find the link and then you got to copy the link. It's just more time and more frustration spent for the teacher. So that's awesome that it's all integrated together. And I wanted to mention too, I just wanted to emphasize that and Classin is perfect for this, that you 
want really stress the informal video partner. I always tell teachers like you don't have time to create Khan Academy quality videos. Those take literally hours. I estimate it takes at least eight hours for me to create that style of video. So it really is just a matter of going into class and hitting the record video button and just talking. And I also tell teachers, if you mess up, if we mess up on a video, we have this tendency to uh, stop, delete, restart. We don't do that in real life. I've already stumbled over words. I couldn't say for Pyrag of, see, you can't even say it. Can't say it today. I'm not stopping and being like, oh, we got to restart this now, right? So emulate real life in your videos. And if you mess up, just keep going. It's just part of life. Or if your dog barks in the background, that happens to me all the time. Just keep going. It doesn't matter. It's all part of life. And in fact, my dogs interrupt my videos all the time. And my students just know that because I tell them about myself, which relates to my next strategy, which is the research really shows and it talks about how it's so important for teachers to let their personality shine. And this kind of links into that enthusiasm factor, right? Uh, so student, students need to know that you're also a human. So share about your kids, your nieces, your nephews, your grandkids, right? The cool kids in your life. If you have pets, like I said, I have three dogs. And so my students know about my dogs and their names and their stories. And I create little like stories about them. And so if they hear them bark in the back of a video, they just know, oh, well, that's Dublin because he's a scaredy cat and he barks at everything, right? <laughs> so that's all part of like letting your personality shine. Share about your hobbies. What did you do this weekend? What do you do on your evenings, right? Uh, they need to know that you're a human. This also relates into my next strategy, which is to create classroom culture. And I know we talk about this a lot, um, but again, just really stepping back and thinking about, am I really doing this now that you know that the, this really is incredibly vital to engagement and therefore achievement. So doing things like prompting conversation topics, and this can be synchronously like right now, or it could be just posting a discussion question in whatever um, learning management system type tool that you use, right? Or if you have, if you use Padlet or, you know, something that you can post to, whatever it is, like post conversation topics. And Jennifer will talk about this a second with class in as well. I find that topics that relate to multiple people <laughs> tend to be food. Everybody eats. So I always do like pineapple on pizza. Yes or no. Right. Cause that's a very, um, charged conversation or I'll do things like tomato or tomato or um you know even things like what's your favorite type of pizza music is always a, a big conversation starter that most people can relate to pets is usually a big one right uh doing things like show and tell and you can do this virtually or in person you can do it synchronously you can do it asynchronously uh telling jokes so I have a teacher that does a dad joke Thursday every Thursday he posts a new dad joke right uh, or even doing things like a weekly riddle and if whoever solves it first gets some sort of prize so use little fun things like that that you can embed here or there so Jennifer show us how we can build this classroom culture and also kind of let our personality shine as a teacher in class in yeah so the class in um, virtual classroom has a teacher toolbox with 25, 30 plus tools for student engagement that can be used for very serious and important learning activities, as well as these conversation starter, more fun topics. Um, you know, the interactive whiteboard can be used to kind of set up any sort of activity that you want. Um, this this picture here of what is your favorite pizza topping, this is something we set up as at a conference, right? So this was just on one of our interactive flat panels and people as they walked by um, kind of ticked off what they were looking for. It was a way to kind of drive that engagement just in a conference setting, um, but can be used obviously in a classroom setting. 
in class in you have the ability to give students the ability or take away their ability to draw or write or add context to the whiteboard as you see fit. Um, super easy to do with permissions. It's a little crown icon that you can give to all students at once and take away. So maybe for the beginning of class, everyone's going to start with a crown so that they can fill out the poll of the day. Um, apparently, one person at this conference did really believe in pineapple on pizza since they got the little heart there. Um, but that's one way you can do it just by setting up these activities on the actual virtual whiteboard and there is um, in one of the teaching tools is this like teaching materials library, which is hundreds and hundreds of images sorted by category and topic area. So you don't even have to go find the picture of the pizza. It's right there in class and you just click food, you find your pizza, you create your poll done and done. Um, a couple other ways that you can use those activities is with our polling option. So sometimes, you know, in co delivering course material, you can use the poll as a quick in class quiz, a check for understanding questions, something like that. Or you can use it for very important questions like who is more famous um, as a Bills fan. I wrote this question in December and now I'm just sad about it. So we're going to move on, but just know that there is polling in there. Um, in addition, there is course level chat. So anytime you open up a new lesson in class in a virtual classroom that you're going to go teach from, there is chat that's specific to that lesson. Another great way if you've got more open ended questions or things that you want to ask is a way. Another way to use one of those tools is to use that chat. So, um, you know, Lindy talked about talking about your pets. Here's a picture of my childhood dog. Um, you know, so in the chat, you can have students guess the name or guess the favorite treat or guess whatever that is. But chat is another one of those functions that you can use. So class in is kind of chock full of these tools that are built for student engagement that can be used both for the very serious uh, academic work of teaching and learning, but can also be used to do some of these really important cultivation of classroom culture activities that Lindy is talking about. Awesome. I love it. I love again that it's all integrated. You don't have to go to another tool to do your discussion. You can just do it right in class in where so you could be solving for square roots and one second on the whiteboard and the next second you're voting on your favorite pizza. And by the way, when I did my pineapple on pizza example, I did not notice that it was the next slide on here. <laughs> I'd like to say that I, I perfectly transitioned that, but but that was not the case. <laughs> All right, so that kind of wraps up bucket number one, which is this idea of belongingness and how it's so important for learners to feel a sense of belongingness that relates directly to engagement, which relates directly to achievement. Let's talk about bucket number two, which is self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a term that basically just means that when you go into a task, you ask yourself, whether subconsciously or consciously, will I be successful at the learning task at hand? Or it doesn't have to be a learning task, at the task at hand, right? Think about it. Any task that you do in your daily life, whether you realize it or not, you're, you're analyzing in your head whether you think you're going to be successful at it. So that's the idea of self-efficacy. So the research tells us, it talks about self-efficacy, by the way, in terms of expectancies, it's a very research term. And when I first heard that, I was like, what are they meaning by expectancies? And I finally figured out that it really means that do students expect that they can do an academic task, right? So again, that idea of like you're analyzing your, whether you expect that you're gonna be successful or not, right? Uh, a big driver in engagement is students' expectancy for success. And when I say that, some people are like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that makes sense. But have you ever really thought about, are you setting your students up to feel successful going into the task? Because if they feel successful, engagement's going to immediately go up or stay the same, right? It's not going to go down. But the opposite happens if we don't feel that we're going to be successful. Because think about it. What happens when you feel like you're not going to be successful at something? I ask this all the time, by the way. And usually I get responses of procrastination. That's the number one response, right? What do we do as humans? If we feel that something's not going to go well, we procrastinate it. We put it off. We put it off. A lot of people will say, I get feelings of anxiety. My palms sweat, right? None of that is going to lead to increased engagement, <laughs> right? So some more information that the research tells us is that providing choice is results in higher perceived competence. 
So in other words, if you give students a choice going into a task, they're going to choose the choice that they feel they're going to be the most successful at equals engagement, right? Or higher engagement than a task that they wouldn't feel successful at. Here's another big, and I'm going to talk more about this. The research says that if students do not know how to access or organize their learning tasks, they're less likely to engage. And oftentimes, and I totally did this as a teacher, I taught middle school and high schoolers, and it was so easy with my high schoolers to chalk it up to them being lazy, to them being disengaged, right? Um, all the excuses, unmotivated, all the excuses of why they're not engaging with the learning tasks that I'm giving them. And I never once thought, Am I presenting these learning tasks to them in a way that's accessible to them? And am I helping them learn how to take all the things that they're getting from their seven, eight classes a day and organize them and figure out how to manage time and how to get them all done? If you have a kid that's overwhelmed at the end of the day, are they going to go home and do their homework? No, they probably are going to shut down. They don't know where to start, right? Then it leads to frustration at home. So then they go home and their caregivers try to help them. It's just more frustration, less engagement. It's kind of a vicious cycle there. So I'll talk more about that in a second, but that's just the research highlights. So let me know in the chat, what strategies do you employ to help develop learner self-efficacy, to help your students feel successful going into tasks? And while you're doing that, I will share a little bit of my first strategy, which is you have to create self-directed learners. And a self-directed learner takes initiative. They take responsibility for their learning, right? If you have a self-directed learner, they're going to have increased perseverance when that learning task gets challenging, right? And I know that is way easier said than done. <laughs> it's way easier to tell you create self-directed learners than it is to actually create self-directed learners. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Sarah says that they connect the task to their prior knowledge experience and provide choice in the task. Love it. So things like, I don't think I, I didn't include choice boards here, but choice boards or playlists, what we call them playlists a lot now, like blended learning. Basically like you're just, Giving students options is huge for increasing self-efficacy. And I love the connecting to prior knowledge experience. Uh, Carmina says they break down steps, provide examples, engage them in a we do activity to gradually release the responsibility. Love that. So that I do, we do, no, yeah, I do, we do, you do. That's a perfect example of gradual release strategy, right? So you're increasing their confidence, you're increasing self-efficacy and kind of gradually releasing them. I also love that you said, break down steps and provide examples. There's actually research out there, this isn't directly related to this, but also kind of related about executive functioning and how to help kids develop executive functioning skills. And they use the terminology, what does done look like? So basically this idea that if you show them an example, an exemplar, what does done look like? What is the example of the end product? That is gonna immediately increase the self-efficacy for a lot of your students. Not all, of course, not every one strategy is gonna work for everyone, um, but that that's a really important one. Love it, thank you guys for sharing. So Jennifer, tell us, class in, how can we create self-directed learners? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the ways that Classen supports this is by giving students lots of opportunities to interact with both their teachers and their peers. So uh, in, you know, kind of the previous slide, we talked about our in-class chat, which is when you're in a live virtual lesson, much like we've got chat here in this session, there's chat that goes along with the course. There's also, or, or along with the lesson, we also offer course level chat, which is within the Classen app at any point in time, students can access that chat and ask questions both of their teacher and of their peer. Um, perhaps they're asking about, um, you know, in the upcoming assignment, can someone, you know, please remind me what the requirements are, point me to the link of where I can find that. Um, I don't remember this concept, uh, you know, in math, can someone point me to where I could go review that? 
hey, I don't remember how to pronounce Pythagorean. Can somebody please help me with that? There's lots of things that they could ask in this course level chat. Um, and so essentially it's giving students a way to be more self-sufficient in identifying the areas that they need help and reaching out. This also gives other students an opportunity to reply um, and participate in some of that peer-to-peer -peer learning. So uh, whereas in it's great if you're a teacher to have chat to monitor, that may also seem like one more thing to do. But in this, you're gonna find students who are really motivated or really passionate or really interested in helping others to chime in and say, oh, here's the link for the assignment requirements or this is how I remember this, let me help you with that. So what you're doing is you're providing students the opportunity both to be the asker and the responder driving um, drive, driving efficacy and confidence in, in both of them. So this is just another thing that's incorporated into class and that we think helps foster that, that sense of um, self-directed learning. Love it. Let me try it one more time. Pythagorean theorem. There we go. Everybody round of applause for me. <laughs> See, I just needed an example. What does done look like? This is how it's apparently for my brain to get it today so i love that i love that there it's kind of almost like a synchronous and an asynchronous chat yep. feature in a way and i love that sense of community where it's not it can be teacher to student but it's not just teacher to student i think one of the reasons another thing i hear in addition to teachers saying engagement is challenging for them i also hear that they don't have enough time they're burnt out they keep getting things added on their plate right so i always tell teachers i'm like are you allowing the other students in your class to help each other? That you're not the only expert, right? Um, that's a great thing about discussion threads and online communities and these types of chat is we can rely on each other to answer each other's questions. And it's not just the student waiting for the teacher to get them a response, which is great. All right, let's see. So I talked about the idea of uh, the research talks about how you have to be really clear on how students access learning tasks, how they organize learning tasks, right? That's really related to self-efficacy. And if they don't feel that they know how to access or organize, they're gonna not feel successful going into that task. So another strategy for you, and this seems so simple when I say it, is to create clarity. That's what the research uses as a term, by the way, it talks about clarity and how important clarity is. It really talks about it with online learning, but with digital learning materials in general. And I always tell teachers, it it just has to be do with routine. We know as teachers, we're masters of routine, right? Especially you elementary teachers. I taught middle school, high school, so I don't know this, but I go in a lot of elementary classrooms and I'm just amazed at how well, especially with the little, little guys, like this is how we line up for lunch. This is how we walk down the hall. This is how we go to recess, right? This is where we put our backpacks. It's routine, 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 routine in a physical classroom, but that routine doesn't always transfer into our digital classrooms. So my next strategy for you is to have a digital course home base and then create clarity in that digital course home base. By having a home base, you're already creating clarity. And the idea here is you have one place where students go to access everything for their class. That's why I call it a home base, right? It's digital. It's your home base for your course or your class. A lot of times this is, you'll hear like the term learning management system or LMS. That's often what schools will use for like their digital course home base, right? So by having that one tool, that's the home base, you're immediately creating clarity because there's no question in the student's mind of where they need to go to get all information for the course. Well, I go to whatever that course home base tool is, class in, right? The next piece of this is one, once they get to that course home base, you have to create clarity and consistency within there. So things like your organization and your navigation, thinking about always having the most recent work on top instead of making them scroll to find it. Um, naming your, whether you divide your class by units or modules or weeks or days, having that organization and navigation be consistent, having consistent naming conventions. So if you decide to divide your course by units, every unit is titled the exact same way. So like unit one colon mitosis, 
unit two colon meiosis, right? And then maybe in parentheses, you put the date, but every single unit is titled the same way. That's called naming conventions. And then even going into the assignments, you have naming conventions for the assignments. So they know if they see a certain abbreviation or emoji that it's a specific type of assignment, right? Maybe you have a specific emoji or acronym or something you use for things that students need to make sure to turn in that are like the must do's, something like that. But creating those, that consistency, that clarity, even thinking about things all the way down to the formatting, thinking about what font you're using, having a color scheme. Um, it's really important to have like basically a style guide for your course. And even better if your organization, your school has a style guide that kind of outlines specific things especially for middle school, high school kids that might be going to seven different classes a day with seven different teachers. No matter what class they're in, they're always going to the same home base tool and they kind of have that consistent navigation and look. So Jennifer, tell us about class in. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for a consistent digital home experience, class in is a great way to do that. Um, what you can see in the big screenshot here is the class in app when it's first launched you've got your courses down the left hand side so if a student is enrolled in multiple class in courses they're all right there listed out um, in very similar ways uh, in addition each course can uh, select their own little thumbnail icon something like that so if that's something a school was looking at then you know all your math classes would be would be red all your english classes would be blue all your science classes would be green I was reading an internet thing recently that like though those people have very different experiences about what colors mean what things what subjects which i went on a rabbit hole on but for the sake of my experience those are the colors you can your mileage may vary um but it creates a very consistent experience for students as they go to find these individual courses once you click onto an individual course you'll be able to which is the smaller screenshot down in there you'll be able to see the course materials for that specific course and that shows your um your resources and homework, uh, your live lessons, if you're in a virtual class, as well as kind of anything else the teachers provided. The icons that go with different types of activities, right, whether it's a resource or a homework or a test or an assessment, um, they all are automatically iconed for you in a very consistent scheme. You also can choose your naming conventions however you want to to create that really consistent experience. I think if we go to the next slide, um, this is maybe how you would set up one of the self-guided lessons that Lindy was talking about, right? So a self-guided lesson, become the character. First, you're going to get your lesson overview. That little folder icon is this show, tes, says that it's a resource. So I know that this is something that as a student, I have to go and I have to consume this information, but it's not something I have to turn in for a grade because I know it's just a folder. So I know that it's a resource. The next you're you know, I called it review me. We're going to watch the getting started video. This is a task. So I know that this is something that I have to go complete. Um, as I mentioned, as a teacher, you get uh, usage analytics on how far every student got in watching the video. So that's just a nice, nice to have in terms of like how students are engaging with the things that you assign, particularly for these more self guided lessons. Um, review me the point of view and characterization overview. So this isn't, you know, another resource, you know that because it's a folder, this is something that I've got to internalize before I can do go do the next assignment. The next thing is a task, then, then there's a task overview, and then a task beyond that. So depending on how you want to use your naming conventions, class in does a reasonable amount of the work for you in terms of iconography, whether it's a resource or a task, whether it's ongoing or on a due date, all of that naming and uh, labeling becomes really standard using the platform, which I know many platforms do this. This is just an example of how class in helps make that a little bit easier. I love that. I love how you said the iconography is already done for you. That's huge. The fact that you have these little visual cues here that tell you, if I see the little pencil icon, it means it's something I need to do. If I see a folder icon, it means I'm gonna find more resources in there. Um, it's one less thing that you have to do as a teacher and you're automatically creating that consistency there. Love it. All right, so a couple of last little things here and then we'll wrap up and give you time for some question and answers. Uh, reflection. So we're talking about building self-efficacy. A big part of building self-efficacy is this idea of metacognition, to know how you learn best, learning about learning. Uh, 
if your students know how they learn best, their self-efficacy is going up, right? They're more apt to be self-directed learners. So we often, I feel like we talk about reflection a lot, um, but it's some, and I am mm -hmm, problem here. I'm the problem, it's me here. That's the first thing that ends up getting cut when I'm running short on time, right? Because it's always at the end. So I'm always like, ah, okay, let's just brush past that, right? And all of my trainings, things, I do this all the time. In reality, I should not be doing that. I should be cutting something else and leaving time for reflection because that reflection is so important and really teaching people how they learn best. Self-assessments are great for this. So having them, not just you as the teacher going through and grading their assessments, but having them assess their own learning. How do you think you did on this? What did you do great at? What did you struggle on? That's um, a really important strategy. So Jennifer, show us how Class In can help. Yeah, so one of the student engagement tools in the Class In platform is what we call a virtual sketchboard. Um, and this is, think about this kind of like a virtual worksheet. So this is a way for students in real time to be able to, um, kind of complete an activity or a reflection or an exercise uh, in class uh, in real time. So as a student, as a teacher, you can hand out your virtual worksheet and then what you can do is watch students as they complete it. So in this instance, you know, draw a picture of how this lesson made you feel. You're really asking students to do that reflection on like, okay, did I understand this concept? Did I not? Was I anxious? Was I confident? Do, how, how do I feel about having learned this? Some of this, uh, as Lindy just said, kind of metacognitive work, it's really easy to do. And in a time crunch, this takes 20 seconds to set up from a teacher perspective. You can give students however much time you want. There's, you know, timers and stopwatches and stuff also built into the class and platform. So we're going to take two minutes out of our whole class to just think about how did this lesson make us feel? Um, obviously, the virtual worksheet can be used as with everything else in class in for the, you know, the, the harder uh, or the academic -y work, right? Like I know people do label the parts of a cell or do show me how you got your answer or kind of lots of things using the same tool, but it can also be used to do some of this self-reflective work that drives student engagement. Um, then when the responses are complete, you can either save them uh, as an asset that gets linked to the student account, or you can just send them back off into the ether if you have kind of satisfied the need to know like, okay, students have done this reflective work. I've looked at the reflective work to say like, okay, everyone felt pretty good about this lesson. I know they feel good. I now feel good and moving on. So this is the virtual sketchboard uh, tool within the class and platform that helps drive some of this uh, self-reflective work in addition to kind of other learning activities. Love it. I also, this is important for students, self-assessment, reflection, metacognition, but it's also great knowledge for you as the teacher, right? to be able to see, and maybe you look at their drawings and you thought that they were engaged by their body language during the lesson, but then you look at this and you're like, oh, maybe that's that's not the case if I'm getting lots of snooze fest drawings on here, you know, whatever it may be. All right, last strategy, I think this is a quick one, um, is again, we're talking about creating self-directed learners so that they increase their self-efficacy. And one big strategy here is to create ownership. In other words, again, the idea of a class being a community and not just the teacher being the, ex the only expert in the room, making sure students know how to answer their questions, where they can go to get their questions answered. Because instead of retreating, when they get to the question, they're going to persevere and go look for the answer, right? And making sure students are empowered to answer their own questions. All right, uh, I might come back to this. I'm going to wrap up real quick and give some Q&A session or Q&A time, I should say. So quick summary, we talked about kind of two engagement buckets. We looked at the research behind what does the research say drives engagement and two big areas are belongingness and self-efficacy. We looked at a lot of different strategies within each of them. We looked at how class in can help you reach those strategies. I just have to say, I love how everything I talked about with consistency and clarity is so wrapped into class in because it's an integrated tool. We don't have to go to here to this tool to do our drawing reflection. We don't have to go to this tool to do our chat. We don't have to go over here to find our assignments. We can do it all within the class in platform. You rarely see that in K-12 ed tech 
um, not even just K-12 ed tech and ed tech in general. And I'm such a proponent of having integrated, integrated tools for teachers and students. So that's awesome. Again, you're going to get a copy of these slides. This is some information on how you can engage with me, my email, my website, my social media handles, all of that good stuff. Jennifer, how can we engage more with class in? Yeah, um, you can visit us online. You can also follow us on socials. Um, I'll send an email uh, to everyone here with the recording and with the uh, download of the slides and feel free to follow up with me directly. If you have any questions or if you found anything about class and interesting, I'm always happy to talk more about it. Um, we're running some feedback sessions throughout the spring. So if you are kind of versed in the space of virtual or hybrid or frankly, in person learning, and you'd like to see a demo of class in and give some feedback on it would super appreciate it but you'll have more information about that in the follow-up email that'll come to you tomorrow awesome and like i said there's uh links to the different research articles and research studies that i mentioned during are all at the end of the slides here for you uh right now i wanted to yeah just open it up to any questions i'm going to stop sharing and We've got a couple minutes left to see if there are any questions that we can answer, anything that we can expand on. Thank you all so much for your sharing during the webinar and participating. It always adds to the webinar to have multiple perspectives. Love it. Carmina says, Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Love the two buckets idea. Thanks. I know I was like, when I first came up with that, I'm like, buckets. I'm like, I kind of like it. <laughs> it's kind of a good visual. <laughs> By the way, I don't, did I mention, I remember I mentioned this on the slide, but the, the third bucket I would definitely add is this idea, the idea of value, right? Like students have to find value in what they're learning in order to be engaged. That's a big third one that I that I talk about. And also metacognition, I talked a little bit about that in terms of self-efficacy, could really be its own kind of fourth bucket in terms of what the research tells us about engagement. Great. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us this afternoon. As I said, look out for those follow-up messages. Lindy, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and such a great presentation. Um, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon or evening, depending on what part of the world you're joining us from. Thanks everyone. Thank you.